You're too late. I've already summoned. What is up, everyone? Welcome to the L2R2 PlayStation Podcast, the show where we break down the PlayStation news of the week. My name is Fonzie. I'm joined by my co host, Indie Game Dev, and my UK bruv from another mum, Callum Monroe. Callum, how the heck are you? Yeah, very good. Yeah, excited to get into it today and talk about some PlayStation things. Um, but yeah, I've been good. Nice. Now you're late, so I'm going to try to bust your balls as much as possible. Keep me, you know, got my hair did and got my outfit ready and I'm just pacing around. I don't feel like to leave the, <laughs> the ladies in the same situation, but it's all good. You're here now. But um, yeah, yeah, fashionably late. Yes, that's how you do it. But uh, yeah, what you been up to? How's your week been? Uh, yeah, just uh, had a busy week, so I didn't get to play too much. Um, but yeah, it's been been good. Just um, packing and getting ready to to move, um, which is always um, you know great fun. But uh, but yeah, I pl- played a little bit of of games, and um, I finished. I should just uh, about an hour ago. I just finished Ratchet and Clank: A Crack in Time, um, which uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, but yeah, just um, busy week got some things to do and uh but yeah it's been been pretty much you know the same boring old stay at home and don't go outside or anything uh but yeah how about you doing good yeah same here i did i was under impression i could get the new vaccine um and so i started doing the sign up process because they like unlocked this new tier for grocery store workers and in my mind i thought okay i work at a coffee shop same thing and i'm with the public and putting items on shelves and blah 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 but then i looked deeper and it's like, nope, you're still a restaurant worker, so you don't get that. Uh, you're, you don't apply to that vaccine. And then uh, there was no plans for restaurant workers, which I thought was crazy. And so just recently, like a couple of days ago, they finally said, okay, restaurant workers are going to be available to get the vaccine at the end of the month. So hopefully soon I can start doing the getting the vaccine stuff. I was trying to look for that single shot one, but that one's hard to get, the Johnson & Johnson. Mm-hmm. So it seems like the standard one there's more of is that double shot. I just wanted to try and get it over with as quickly as possible but i'll take that double shot one you know if that's all they got yeah, but you have to you have to go onto the johnson johnson website and spam refresh to, to try and <laughs> yeah. get it in your basket and <laughs> yeah, it's like one of these uh, rtx cards or ps5 or something yeah <laughs> but yeah i've been uh yeah, doing no, that's that. really good though yeah you'll, you'll be able to um get the nanobots put into you and you'll hear all these new alien voices that i've been able to hear <laughs> Um, so yeah, open. looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, sign me up, man. I need some excitement in my life. <laughs> but yeah, we were talking about uh, playing some games. I did play a bunch of the uh, Crash Bandicoot 4 on PS5. I was playing that throughout the week, and I'm digging it. It's pretty dope. It's uh, really beautiful, too. That's one thing that caught me off guard was it already looks really good on PS4, but on PS5, it's in 4K, and you got the 60 frame per second mode, and it's just dope. But it's, it's crazy how these games lure you in with the with the first couple of levels it's simple enough but then it quickly gets like really complicated and hard and Mm -hmm. you have to be fast and pinpoint accuracy with the with the mechanics with the you know just platforming but it's still very fun it's just it's definitely like older crashes where it's it's pretty tough yeah it's uh i mean i found the same when when the trilogy came out i just i couldn't remember how difficult those games were so um, and I've heard Crash Four is just exactly the same, if not even harder than than, than th- those three. So um, yeah, I suppose you probably got your work cut out for you. But I think the good thing about them is they're normally only hard if you're going for like a um, hundred percent completion. I mean, they are just right. hard in general, but um, you know, with enough brute force, you can you can get yourself through. But um, yeah, they are really really difficult games. They do require sort of such exact movements and jumps and and everything but um but yeah no i'm I'm really interested to see how to see how it is so it's it's i'm sort of glad you're enjoying it and um you know it looks nice on the ps5 i'm sure it looks amazing um but yeah it's nice to nice to see games like that um you know and we've got ratchet and clank coming as well um it's nice to see these sort of you know nice fun sort of games still still around and and you know drawing people into them yeah, there's still a market for these platformers. And even though with Crash 4, it's um, it's on the harder side, but it's still approachable. Like, uh, you're right, where they kind of move the difficulty a bit to, 
Oh, my cough's coming back. Uh, they move the difficulty a bit to where if you're trying to complete everything, that's where a lot of it is. If you want to try and get 100% and get all the trophies. But there is a lot of, tr- of trophies popping just from existing, just from playing the game. There's a lot of little Easter eggs that you can find. You'll get trophies for that. The nods to Naughty Dog and other Crash games. And yeah, it's 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 really cool. It's just, um, it's not like it's, uh, you know, Dark Souls level difficulty. Yeah. So uh, it's definitely enough for me. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty tough there. But I'm having fun playing it. And then I did drop this for the past couple of days because I just got into Valheim. And I know everyone's talking about it. wanted to give it a shot. And Valheim is really dope. It's uh, just this survival sim kind of game where you you can create sort of like Minecraft. You can um, manage for, for your items and create your little uh, defense structures and where you sleep at night and salvage and fight these enemies. It's really dope. And I can, I, I can already tell the addictive nature of it. And now all I want to do is play is Valheim. It's, it's very fun. I highly recommend it. Yeah. I've, I've heard um, things about it, but I honestly haven't really seen anything at all. I knew it was like a survival game and, um, and that people really liked it. But um, what's that? Is that on PC or is it on PlayStation as well? At the moment, it's just on PC. Yeah. So it's about, uh, I want to say like 20 bucks on PC. It's actually pretty cheap. And yeah, so you're surviving, you are crafting items. You're, I want to say the world randomly regenerates because there is a seed component when you start the game. Mm -hmm. So very much like a Minecraft kind of thing. But uh, it's where it differs from Minecraft is you don't have that full creative ability to like to build exactly what you want, say with Minecraft, which what keeps it fun there, but you can still, it's heavier on the action component. So it's more fun to, just to traverse the world and fight these enemies and build yourself up. It's pretty hard, but at the same time, they give you a little, um, just little bits to kind of keep you going. So it's not like really punishing you, but it's really fun to just try and find these items and figure out the world too, because there's this, um, just this crazy storyline going, or there's, as you're walking around the world, there's this huge tree that goes like into the sky and it's like this massive, you know, they don't tell you what's going on there. You kind of have to figure out the story as you go along and it's super interesting. So there's that, you know, carrot on the stick as well as just building your items and surviving. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Is it a multiplayer like PVP or is it just single player or? I'm not sure. I know there's abilities in the options rather than let you like jump into other people's games or start some kind of open game, but I haven't really jumped in and I don't want anybody jumping into my world. So I just, I know it's there, but yeah. uh, I haven't seen multiplayer gameplay, but uh, there might be something yeah. like that, like a small server kind that, of thing. That, that's good. Cause most of these kind of games are like multiplayer, you know, like rust and um, that's the only game I can actually think of right now. I know there's loads of them, but sure. um, it's nice to sort of see single player ones because you know, you know that I prefer single player games anyway. I don't like people sort of coming and killing me and I like to sort of explore at my own leisure. And, um, so that's cool. I think survival games are, are, they do have that very addictive kind of, uh, feel to them, you know, starting with nothing, finding new things and discovering, uh, you know, new resources, figuring out what you can craft with them and becoming stronger. And, um, so yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. I've, I've heard quite a lot about it. Um, so it's obviously, uh, people are obviously enjoying it um but yeah no that's 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 cool it's um i've definitely yeah it's definitely something i i would look at playing if i didn't have a backlog of 300 million games yeah that's same here <laughs> i don't need to add this to the you know to the mix because it's very addictive where i just want to play this but yeah i, I yeah. like how it's it's just separate from games like say the forest or um you mentioned rust as well where the the kind of carrot on the stick is figuring out the world because there's a weird you know, mystery with the lore that's going on, but also the, just the constructing mechanics are really fun. So it's all physics based. So you have to really plan how you're building your house. Cause it'll just fall apart on you. If you don't build it correctly, they're the trees. When you knock them down, there's physics involved in that and they're massive. So if you do it wrong, you just kill yourself or have it drop in your house um, really cool. You do drop your items when you die, but they leave a little post there. So, you know, like you can go grab them and, and oh, pick nice, them up yeah. and, and there's yeah. uh, rain effects. And I know, uh, I was listening to a playthrough from another podcaster and they had gone on this super far trip with a boat. They had all their stuff that they had collected and it started raining and the boat that they were on started filling with rain and they were getting closer to the, to the shore. But it's like a matter of, okay, is this boat going to sink before I get there and I'm going to die? or I'm going to make it in time. And it was really tense. So I love all these different mechanics that layer on top of each other mm. to make you really feel like you're 
you're in there and there's this high risk reward kind of thing going on that which I think they nail. But um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping this can come to consoles pretty soon. It just came out and already it's selling like, uh, I want to say they reached a million copies with the first week. So it's just skyrocketing. Amazing, so yeah. hopefully they can get this yeah. to consoles pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When, when you first said about it, I assumed it was multiplayer, so I instantly was like, ah, it's just another Rust sort of clone. But I mean, look at just looking at the footage that you're showing now and uh, everything. It, it looks really cool. I might have to might have to give it a try. Um, so, sounds yeah, really interesting. I love the idea of the you know going out on these big voyages, uh, you know, trying to you know test uh, you know the, the the sort of boundaries of how far you can go and and everything. I love that kind of risk reward. Uh, sort of system so um yeah it sounds really really cool yeah they don't tell you much and there's always this kind of balance with not bombarding you with all the stuff you can do and the options but also not keeping you completely in the dark and i think they do they tow a good line where they just tell you enough as you're starting to understand the world before they start just layering your all these different mechanics on top of you so it was enough for a dummy like me to start to wrap my brain around it um, I was going to give a quick shout out to Luke the Llama in the chat saying, hey, guys, love the hat, Callum. Um, yeah, uh, Luke is... Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, thank you, Luke. He's playing a, a bunch of Resident Evil right now on his uh, Twitch uh, stream lately. I've been jumping in watching him. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw him um, a tweet about playing it with, with some uh, texture packs, was it, or some mods or something. Yeah. Um, which I didn't even know know there were. So, but yeah, I appreciate the, the compliment on the hat and... Uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for watching. You know what that reminds me? I didn't pull it up, but it's uh, Resident Evil related. But they announced the full title for that Resident Evil reboot movie that's coming out. I want to say this September, mm-hmm. this uh, fall. It's called yeah. Resident Evil: Welcome to Raccoon City. That's the full title. Okay. How, yeah, how do you feel not, about that? Not too keen on that title. <laughs> uh, I saw. I saw. I didn't. I didn't see the the title, but I saw the poster they released because because there've been quite a few fan made posters which looked really great. And then they released mm. the official poster and it just and it just had like a bunch of character names on it and it was just like i just didn't really understand the point in that but you know I, it's, it's quite confusing at the moment because we've got the resident evil anime sort of series coming out right and then the net and then the netflix movie isn't it which i imagine this is what this is um so yeah, there's so a quite cg one right to, to, yeah i think the cg one's a series and then there's going to be um the movie which has uh there's, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of skins which is this great british uh sort of coming of age series yep um but there's a actress who's quite big now and she's playing claire redfield and she's from skins which uh is pretty cool it's kind of like a full circle thing for for me and sort of probably most british people my age to to see effie from skins play claire redfield in resident evil which <laughs> i'm excited about whether or not it'll be good or not i don't know but um yeah yeah yeah, quick uh, shout out to Turdman95 in the chat. Yeah, asking the, is this the animated movie? I saw Netflix were doing something. Yeah, so there is an animated movie. I want to say that's the Netflix one. And then there's the the full cinematic reboot of those movies, yeah. live action movies, yeah. and possibly something else they got going on. I know they have a bunch of different, there's more anime stuff or like CG stuff than anything else right now. Yeah. But yeah, I think, um, I think the animated one's a, a series, I believe. Um, and then the the I, th- I think but yeah it's very it's just very confusing because you've got these two resident evil properties coming out at the same time um but uh yeah it's exciting either way i mean i, I love anything resident evil so um i'm all for it but you know they, they always tend to have questionable quality uh just because they i think i think you kind of have to have that b movie charm with resident evil so I, and i think that's quite a hard line to sort of toe um and i think we've talked before about the resident evil 2 remake sort of like perfectly executing that kind of cringy b-movie charm um sort of really well so hopefully they'll they'll get it um and uh give us something you know half decent yeah i'm really hoping especially with the live action reboot because i i really dug the first resident evil movie with Mila Jovovich. I'm in love with her till the mm. day I die. She's awesome. Yeah. That movie's uh, really cool and creepy and moody. And then they just throw that out the window with the, the, the next ones. It's just like Michael Bay yeah. transformer style. Yeah. Super yeah. weird. Doesn't make yeah. any goddamn sense. And it, at least at the end of that series, they try to throw in like the fan favorite, you know, characters mm. and bring it back to life, even though they make, it makes no sense. But, um, yeah. yeah, at least they tried towards the end but i was just very disappointed with the 12 movies they put out so i'm, I'm really excited <laughs> for them to bring this back to life and try and get closer to that original like essence of resident evil mm. 
Yeah, definitely. And and to sort of go back to the original point, um, Welcome to Raccoon City is a terrible title. Um, so it's not a good start. <laughs> right. Yeah, hopefully it's very small print underneath just Resident Evil. Like, Yeah. Oh <laughs> but yeah, I didn't pull that up, but I did read that just recently. But uh, Cal, we can jump into some of the news. We've got quite a bit of news here to go through. So we got the first one here. It's pretty dope. It's uh, pretty huge for PSVR. Uh, we have next-gen PSVR controllers revealed, including includes haptic feedback and adaptive triggers. This is from PushSquare.com, Liam Croft. Sony has revealed the new set of next-generation PSVR controllers it has in the works. Plan to ship alongside the new headset. The hardware manufacturer has opted for an orb shape that is similar to other VR devices seen on PC. They are said to be well-balanced and comfortable to hold in each of your hands. These new controllers will also include lots of new features. So each one will have an analog stick, adaptive triggers, haptic feedback, and finger touch detection. The controller can detect your fingers without any pressing in the areas where you place your thumb, index, or middle fingers. This enables you to make more natural gestures with your hands during gameplay. The controllers will be tracked by the headset itself rather than a camera placed next to your TV. The new controllers appear to feature every single button present on the PS5 pad, except for the touchpad and D-pad. So Calum, this dropped this week or last week. How do you feel about finally seeing these controllers? And they're definitely different from the, the PS VR wands we were used to. Yeah, I think they, I think it looks really, really good. Um, it, it, with the haptic feedback, which I imagine will go through, you know, the whole thing. Um, obviously, first it would be great to have the haptic triggers because we've already got a taste of them with the with dual sense. Um, so that worked really well in VR, and it looks like these this sort of all thing means that we'll be able to get some feedback all over our hands, which um, is is you know is is interesting as well. So yeah, I think they look really good. It's it's just annoying because I've just bought a Quest Two um and now it's looking and and we've already said that playstation vr is getting lots of good exclusivity and everything so um i'm kind of sat here regretting my choice um (laughs) because i probably should have waited but we've already said that this is going to have to be priced really competitively so hopefully it's on the cheap side of things um like the consoles were as well so um, but yeah it's really exciting to start to finally get get a look at these things and uh, see sort of what route they're they're going down with a new headset um yeah, I, th- I think they look really, really cool. Yeah, same here. I like that this is more of an updated, um, you know, version to, to compete with other VR controllers out there. It's almost like the this is the this was the original goal because they really just kind of copy and pasted and use reuse those PSVR wands or the Move wands rather, and it was that was kind of just something to get them out of the gate. But we never saw a, a, a reiteration or a change on that, and so this is finally like an actual VR controller. So I wonder if this was the goal from the get-go to get something dialed in like this. But I love that we get the dual sense features in this, the haptic feedback. Um, yeah, it's interesting that we don't have the light bar sensor thing on this. So it's tracked by the headset itself. And I don't know enough about VR to say that that's going to work better or worse. Um, I know that the Oculus, I, I want to say functions the same way. There's like sensors on the outside of the controller which is yeah. usually why it's rounded in the first place to then sense the controller, sense the world or sense the headset rather. So that seems to be, you know, accurate enough. So I think they're going yeah. towards that. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. I mean, from, from what they've said, it sounds like it's just using the, the, the technology that all the other headsets are using, you know, um, not needing a camera to point you as, as if it's like a Nintendo Wii or something. Um, it's, it just sounds like, yeah, they're, they're really, making an effort to to put this into the the sort of now updated vr market and, and make it actually competitive and um because like we've mentioned lots of times they they've got some great exclusive games on there like resident Evil, uh, hitman um iron man you know all the all these different games that are only on psvr so all they need to do now is bring out a new headset that that can actually drive with the other the other ones maybe not in terms of quality or you know resolution or anything like that but at least in how you use it how you access it um but you know there's been lots of rumors about playstation trying to uh release something that's standalone to the console so whether or not we'll see something like that where it is wireless like your quest is and then you can connect it to your playstation with with usb c um mm. that 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 could be a thing as well so um, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, the the semantics of of it all, and um, you know how how because we've only really seen the the controllers and that's it, which you know is fine, but it's uh, definitely wetting my appetite. To see. Yeah, um, Luke in the chat also mentions he was hoping this would be 
the PSVR 2 would be wireless to kind of, you know, fix or upgrade on the whole wire situation on the original PSVR. I want to say when they, two weeks ago, when they initially talked about the fact that PSVR 2 is real, they mentioned that it's going to be a wired device. So I'm hoping maybe there is a workaround where there's, it's wired to a hub, but then it can be wireless to the actual um, headset. But it, it must be they're going forward with this idea that does separate them from the other VR units where they're piggybacking off of the P- PS5 to do a lot of the processing. And a lot of these other devices they seem to be doing the processing on their own although they still need a pc i get that with like the the, with the valve one the valve index but it seems like until they can somewhat separate it it's always going to have to be tethered some way there is ways to stream to stream data you know from the headset to the ps5 that exists out there so yeah it seems like they're they're still hunkering down on it being wired but when you i feel like the oculus is going to be the best competitor next to them now and with Oculus being totally, you know, wireless, having that option, it's it's tough to for them to not go that route. But I wonder if that's because they're relying so much on the hardware of the PS5 to do the heavy lifting to where they have to have it, you know, wired in some way. Yeah. I mean, I mean if you look at the, the big VR games like Resident Evil, for example, um, Hitman, I mean, these games wouldn't work on the Oculus Quest without a PC anyway. So you're still going to have to be wired in to play those games. So I don't think they necessarily have to be wireless. I think they just have to at least match the the sort of um, complexity of of the Quest and how that connects to a PC. Because the Quest just connects to the PC, to a PC with a USB C cable, which you know, as as everyone knows now, because it's just the cable we use for everything. It's an ultra fast cable and the ps5 already utilizes that it has a USB C port on the front um so yeah i think as long as it's just one cable that we have to deal with i don't think anybody will have any issue with that the problem with the first headset was the fact you had to have a processing box you had to plug in about five different hdmis um you had like two or three cables coming off the headset itself and it was just a, a mess um so as long as yeah as long as it's the same experience that i have with my quest when i connect it to my pc then i think that's all they have to do um whether or not they have a wireless mode like the quest does where you can play maybe these games that require less power or or you know these smaller games like super hot or whatever um i think that'd be a bonus but i don't think it's it's something they have to do because as long as it pairs with the ps5 and we, we already know the ps5 is really powerful um i think that'll be that'll be plenty yeah i know with uh, my experience playing uh playing half-life alex on the oculus so you normally have to plug it into your pc but there are these other external mods that let you use your wi-fi to stream the data to your oculus so you can have it fully wireless so that stuff is out there as a matter or, or, or trying to get trying to figure out how to do that with your psvr where it just like naturally does that with the ps5 i don't know how you can do that but uh it is possible like with people it was quick you know plugins and doodads updating your ip address and you're able to do it wirelessly and it was pretty dope there's a slight lag but there is a way to do that so if you know, I, I would be dope for them to proceed and try and figure that out so you can have a legit wireless option yeah. with maybe slightly more lag or just you know plug it in have it tethered that way but yeah, we're still in the you know infancy of figuring out what they're going to upgrade as far as you know changes from the original PSVR. Um, at least with the controllers are on the right track to being more competitive with everything else that's on the market now, because the market has changed mm-hmm. since that PSVR originally launched. So yeah, I'm hopeful. We still haven't seen the headset yet. I'm wondering how they're going to change that um, dynamic and you know add features to that. So I'm super stoked. It seems like with two weeks ago they re- uh, started talking about the PSVR two. And now we got the controllers. It seems like they're really going to spend this year hyping it up and then, you know, hopefully hitting next year at some point, 2022. But um, I'm excited for the news that they're rolling out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think to, just going going back to the Quest, because obviously that's the only thing we have to compare. Um, I mean, that thing's £299. I think it's $299 as well, which is even yeah. like a better price. Um, and although it is limited to what it can do without connecting to a PC. It can still play some pretty incredible games at really, really great resolutions and performance. Like there's a Walking Dead game on there, uh, which I tried and, and is, is really good and looks amazing and can be played fully wirelessly. Um, so if that's, if that's going to cost you $299, then why, then there's no reason why the PlayStation 5 one can't be priced at the same 
the same price point and have you know a wireless uh you know capabilities um but i think first and foremost they need to they need they, they don't need to worry about the wireless i think the most important thing is is you know making it powerful making the resolution high making it perform well um and yeah making it just as easy as possible you know maybe including it with a super long USB-C cable that can plug straight into the PS5. Um, and I think having the USB-C port in the PS5, I think is probably quite a, uh, is, is perhaps a reason or the reason they put that on there is, is perhaps for this because having USB-C to USB-C is, uh, you know, as we know, really, really fast uh, connection. So, um, it could be sort of, uh, why it's there. Yeah, I think you nailed it with why we have the USB-C on the very front there. I think that's what they're going to rely on to connect this thing, mm-hmm. um, which may, maybe means that we don't need a, an actual like little processing unit if it's going right into the, the box or the PS5 itself. Um, there mm-hmm. is another ripple to all this, at least with competition with Xbox, because there was a story last week. I want to say it was IGN Italy was starting to talk about it, where some users got their new Xbox wireless headset, which you might have seen in the news. It just looks really dope. It's this from a first party, you know, Xbox, Xbox wireless headset. But when you plug it in, there's uh, some kind of messaging about VR. And now everyone's wondering, okay, are, is there plans in the, in, the, in the future for Xbox to support, you know, third party VR, not do their own, but support, say, an Oculus or a Index where you just plug it in and use that hardware it seems like that's a great way to compete with PSVR and not, they don't really even need their own hardware. They just allow it to work on their yeah. system itself. Uh, that'd be amazing. And then that would also make, uh, make it tough for people to decide, well, do I have to, you know, would I go to PlayStation if I already have my own VR unit when it works on the yeah. Xbox and I just take it over there? It's going to be interesting, but it's still up in the air whether Xbox is going to do that or not. Yeah, I, th- I think, well, I mean, Microsoft already talks to the Oculus in how it allows you to, you know, use your Windows machine on there. And um, I think there's quite a few other Microsoft related apps on the Oculus. So they already have that relationship uh, there. And you're right, it would make sense just to allow connection with an Oculus to an Xbox the same way we connect it to a PC. Um, so that would be, yeah, that'd be a great, a great sort of choice, I think, uh, to do that. I, whether or not the Valve Index would work just because it seems to be quite a complex sure. uh, machine. I'm not sure whether it'd be worth, uh, you know, doing that, but yeah, there, there's no reason why I, I don't think they would have to create their own headset. They've already got their HoloLens, uh, you know, mixed reality, uh, stuff. Uh, so they, they definitely know what they're, they're doing in that, in that sort of, uh, respect. But, um, but yeah, I think we all know that VR is now not quite a gimmick because it wouldn't still be here as, as it sort of is. Um, so I think for Xbox to sort of not, I don't don't mean compete, but at least offer players a way to experience VR on their console would be a great um, idea. Oh yeah. And they seem to be owning the first part of this year with news and with announcements. And so I wouldn't doubt that if they were able to drop this bombshell too this year, I mean, it's, so you can definitely tell there's more competition and, you know, the tide is starting to change, starting to swing in different directions compared to last gen. So it's super interesting. But, also, uh, Steam Cap- VR as an app sucks. So, <laughs> if I, if you know, if 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 they make it so that you can connect your Oculus Quest to an Xbox and um, play, you know, games like Half Life Alex or whatever, then then I would definitely consider maybe looking at an Xbox Series S to just to connect my Quest into, um, because you're going to need at least like an eight hundred pound PC to. To play VR on it, so right. um, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely there's definitely an opening there for for Xbox to to uh, sort of latch on to. You're right. The Steam VR app, I've had so many issues with trying to play yes. Oculus and connecting it and not registering and unplugging. Like I know for from the get go from the beginning, I eventually nailed it, but there's a good 20 minutes every time of setup and troubleshooting yes. and <laughs> something's not talking to something else. Man, super annoying. So yeah, if they yeah. can just streamline that for console, I'm on board. Yeah. I'm an Xbox bot at yeah. that point. <laughs> all right account we got some news here from playstation uh evo was purchased by playstation so sony buys fighting game tournament evo evo online confirmed for august so this is from push square robert ramsey has the story 
The Evolution Championship Series, more commonly known as EVO, was the biggest fighting game tournament in the world. However, a combination of coronavirus complications and allegations of sexual misconduct put a stop to EVO 2020 and subsequent online event EVO 2020 Online. Following an overhaul in management, it was unclear whether EVO would make a return this year, but now we have confirmation that it's happening and it's Sony pulling the strings. The Japanese giant has has actually just acquired EVO in partnership with esports business RTS and is pushing forward with plans with EVO Online 2021, which will take place in August. Considering the rich history of EVO as a global event, this move could be viewed as a significant step in the world of esports for both Sony and PlayStation. So Callum, I'm sure you've seen this news. How do you feel about this? Seems like a big get for for PlayStation to you know fully align and, and have more control over EVO or really have this as PlayStation's kind of, um, you know, uh, a long line event for for tournaments and kind of control this space here but how do you feel about this uh yeah i don't really um, i mean i'm not in this space at all um you know fighting games aren't really my thing um and i think that the sort of esports community is for people who absolutely adore those kind of games so um i'm not i'm not entirely sure what it really means or or anything like that but um i know that it is a big you know a big event and it has a big sort of share of uh you know market share of, of that kind of thing so yeah it's it's obviously a big move um i think people were you know you see it all the time we, we always go on about it but people were like annoyed that <laughs> that they announced this on twitter as if like that as if there's they only have like a limited amount of tweets or something um <laughs> so i have no idea why people would take it so personally that they announced this and didn't announce the acquisition of valve or something like that right um but uh yeah it's um obviously they have bought them for a reason they've got plans for that and esports is, is is a massive thing now but you know it's obvious that it's still budding in what it could become so um it's definitely some a good business move to get involved in that yeah i'm in the same boat where i'm not a huge you know, fan of esports or just uh, understand a lot of it, uh, but I, I still understand that it's huge. It's every year, all these huge events that they have across the board. There's other, you know, different uh, fighting tournament events that are that are massive. And then coronavirus, uh, coronavirus, of course, you know, threw a wrench in the system, but there's been a lot of online events. And so it seems like, you know, they're trying to future proof and, and just align towards this for when these things uh, eventually open up again. But um, I can still tell it's a huge move for PlayStation. It just doesn't, you know, call to me or appeal to me. But it seems like a very big deal for the people that do love their esports. Yeah. Had to move my dog here. She was a. Uh, she heard esports and she came running around. What? Oh. <laughs> All right, Cal, we can transition to our next one here. So we had the Square Enix Presents event this week or last week. So they announced some stuff. We can get into it. We got. Um, from Polygon had the overview of all the different announcements. Uh, Life is Strange True Colors will launch se- September 10th. In addition to that, so we got 2015's Life is Strange and uh, Life is Strange Before the Storm remaster coming out on the same day um, that is happening. Are you a big Life is Strange fan, Calum? Um, I tried the first game um, and I just do, couldn't really get into it. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's I've heard really, really good things and and the studio who made life is strange i can't remember their name now um but they're the same guys who did vampire as well um and i really liked vampire and the writing and and the story it seemed like a game where um the writing team had sort of really done their research and sort of really been careful about you know the the the, the, the kind of things they talk about and um so it's kind of made me want to go back and see if maybe i I, I would enjoy it if I gave it another chance. Um, but yeah, I, I like that they've ditched the episodic thing just because Life is Strange was one of the big games that came out when episodic games were like the trend. Um, and we've seen that now be ditched with this new Life is Strange game. We saw it with Hitman 3 as well, because obviously Hitman 1 and maybe 2 were episodic. So it looks like that kind of fad is gone, which... Um, is quite nice uh but uh yeah it, it, it does look cool um and uh yeah so i might might look at um at trying it out but um maybe not as well <laughs> yeah at least for me this would be a great uh psn now game or ps plus game rather at some point if it were to get on there i know they i want to say with life is strange they made an appearance on game pass but if they could show up on PS Plus, I think I'd be more inclined to jump in and, and try it out. But yeah, I know people really dig uh, their series of games, so 
Um, we got some news on a on a new entry and then a remaster coming out this fall. Um, so we got. I want to say the other... first one did did was on Plus at some point because I've I've got it for some reason and that's okay. normally like when I have these games that I have no recollection of buying I I imagine that they must have been free on Plus at some point, um, but there's no reason why they can't do it again um, because you know people miss games monthly and and this would make sense with with these new ones coming out. Right, especially if they go with that remaster of Life is Strange and Before the Storm to do that on PS Plus, getting people, you know, hyped up for that new entry. So that'd be a good way to just drum up, you know, fan the fan base for that. So we'll see if yep. they end up aligning with Sony there. But um, going along the other announcements, we got Forspoken. So this is uh, first announced at PlayStation's June 2020 event. The all new IP from Luminous Productions, originally called Project Athea, now has a title. It's called Forspoken, launching in 2022. So I have this trailer loaded up, Calum. If you want to check it out, you can watch my feed here. But we got to see some footage on it. And it looks pretty nuts. I've been hit by an advert. <laughs> oh, of course, yep. And I do yeah, like okay. that they, they start off the trailer with the main uh, actor... Um, kind of doing the intro for that character. I, I like that. Uh, I want to see that more in some some cases. Yeah, it's nice to sort of get that perspective um, from the because I mean, the, the acting in games is so much more involved now. Um, just because you know mocap's so much better, and I, I imagine it it minimizes a lot some of the work that animates have to do as well. Um, so it's really cool to see it from their perspective. I mean, we see like Troy Baker and. Uh, Ashley Johnson are very vocal about Last of Us and the development process and everything. So it's nice to see more of that because, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting perspective. So I'm at the point in this trailer where we're seeing this dragon and she drops mm -hmm. the, is that a motherfucking dragon? Which I know online people are already excited <laughs> <laughs> that she's... Yeah. Uh, React in that way. Yeah, it looks very. It looks very like I don't really understand. It's one of those games that I know we haven't seen a lot of, but because you see a lot of gameplay of her sort of in this kind of casual modern day attire, and then you see her in this more fantasy s um, outfit. So it's right. uh, it's one of those games where I'm not entirely sure what what to expect, but it looks good. Uh, it, it does look really cool, and I like the sort of movement. Uh, it looks quite interesting, um, but I think what's kind of strange is how you know it was this big unreal 5 uh shaft um and it's not even being made on unreal 5 which i thought was quite uh strange i get that it's square enix and they probably want to keep it um you know on their own engine to you know minimize having to transfer things over to something that the team don't know but um it's definitely you know it, i think that engine's great and it looks nice and it looks you know final fantasy 15 and 16 look really great and final fantasy 7 uh might be on the same engine but um you can definitely see it's definitely a, a downgrade in some respects to that first uh showing um but it does look really cool um and i love square enix and i think when they're making fantasy games like this is when they're at their best so um yeah i'm really excited yeah i, I thought at some point during that trailer that during the gameplay anyways maybe because of that desert scene but I, I got those same vibes of that ue5 tech demo but yeah you're right where it's this mm. internal uh, engine from square enix so this is yeah. this is their own thing and it looks really good so it's cool that they can mm. reach that potential um i am excited to see when we actually are going to get games that are on ue5 because i know that when they initially mm. announced that it was still years out but i'm hoping you know 2020 two maybe we start to see games that actually use that engine because that engine looked insane yeah it is really exciting to sort of as we sort of wait and and see when this is finally going to start being utilized because that tech demo we got for project Appio was was awesome and and as they sort of went into more detail about how they can uh you know they'll be able to render really complicated objects without it you know taxing the, the hardware and everything it seems like a real revolutionary sort of step for engines so yes yeah, i can't wait to start seeing the games made on that yep same here. So we'll go down some of the other announcements. So uh, People Can Fly's third-person loot shooter, Outriders, is launching April 1st, and it'll be on Game Pass Day 1. So we got that for the Game Pass fans. 
uh, Tomb Raider Definitive Survivor Trilogy. So this was uh, leaked uh, a bit ago, and so they finally showed it off. But it's a three-game Tomb Raider Definitive Survivor Trilogy bundle comprising Tomb Raider 2013, Rise of Tomb Raider, and Shadow of Tomb Raider. It's available now on PlayStation Store and Microsoft Store. It's $19.99, but we'll go up to $49.99 in two weeks. So better jump on that. Are you a big uh, Tomb Raider fan? Does this call out to you? Um, I loved the first reboot. Um, I think the, the the you know the 2013 Tomb Raider is a really sort of underappreciated game. Um, and Rise of Tomb Raider was good as well. But I, I never I never played Shadow of the Tomb Raider. But I'm quite confused as to what this is. So is it just literally those three games? But like there's no yes. difference. To it? So I think 49.99 is quite, is quite steep um, considering Shadow was free recently um and tomb raider and rise of the tomb raider i've seen for like pennies on the store as well yeah. so um it's quite an odd uh i i just don't really understand the point in it if it's just those three games packaged together but you know if, if people want to spend 50 <laughs> sure <laughs> well at least yeah it's 20 bucks for now and i think then that right the the two weeks for 20 dollars is a sweet spot because that seems like a more fair yeah. price for those three games i yeah. don't know for sure if you're getting any upgrade for ps5 or next gen i i don't believe so so maybe it will just run yeah. maybe a little bit more efficiently but there's no like full overhaul but yeah you're getting those yeah. three games which you could possibly find for for cheaper than 50 bucks altogether but um Amazing. yeah that was announced do you think we see a reboot in this trilogy or in this series anytime soon like going back to tomb raider and maybe just like a full-blown new story with tomb raider anytime soon i don't know because i i haven't played shadow so i don't know where the story's gone um since rise but um i i honestly really really loved the first two um especially the first one um so i i, I like the kind of more uncharted-esque approach that they they've taken I say Uncharted, I mean, there's a lot more to it because obviously there, especially the first one is quite a non-linear uh, open world um, yeah. where you sort of progress depending on what equipment you've unlocked and, and things like that, which I, which I, I love that kind of sort of um, progression. Um, so I don't know whether they, they need to reboot it again. I know a lot of people weren't too keen to the Tomb Raider, but maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the next game they, they should approach it trying to you know capture more people more fans of the the original series i know a lot of people who like the original series don't like this new series so mm. um maybe something that has a similar mood to those older you know more puzzle based um games um so, so, i mean i know there are puzzles in this game and i can't speak for shadow of the tomb raider again but um there's definitely a different kind of vibe uh, between the two series so maybe trying to uh match that slightly better could could be a good good uh option i know in a uh, shadow so i played a good maybe three four hours of it I've, I've yet to complete it i think i have on pc and on ps4 and my, maybe even on xbox with game pass but uh, i did enjoy the fact that they let you choose in the beginning of the game whether you wanted difficulty in say the platforming or the puzzle or the you know the shooting mechanics so that you can kind of toggle the difficulty where you where you see fit so that was a neat idea and although it seems like this is the shadow was the end to that trilogy and if they go back to it again it would be a full-blown reboot but maybe these core games are so strong they could just keep that story going i haven't finished shadow but it seems like from what i heard it kind of finishes that that story arc so at least if you do go back to the well and reboot it take the best parts of these three uh games recently and try and you know proceed further with whatever that future of tomb raider would be but and it's also now in a world without uncharted so you don't have that competition at least at the moment so what do they do with without that being on their heels you know this time and maybe they completely switch it up i don't know go first person or something crazy but um yeah i'm excited to see what they would actually change up if they go back to tomb raider which i have to imagine they will because it's a huge franchise yeah it is one of those those franchises that you'd imagine just can't really be left um but yeah i don't i don't i don't know it's it's a tough one because again i loved the first two of the rebooted uh the rebooted trilogy i mean rise definitely did feel a lot more linear and a lot less sort of quality than than the first game i think but um yeah it's it's interesting i do need to play shadow but um yeah, I, I just really don't know because if if a new Uncharted gets announced as well, then 
that there really isn't going to be much want need for a new two raider game um they really it really has lost its sort of fan base i i think so um but you know we don't we never know they might they might have a really great idea on how to um you know bring people back to it and, and excite people again um but i'd just like to see more of how the first game was you know this really open-ended rpg kind of game um which had a great story and uh and really amazing sort of environments um and i feel like that may have been lost in the in the others um but I, personally I, i'd like to see more of like the uncharted and lost legacy with chloe um and nadine i think that they're, they're both great characters and i'd much rather sort of somebody take that and just replace <laughs> two raider with with those characters yeah it's it's interesting but yeah i think uh they have some the stronger you know route they can take is yeah focusing on that open world and going completely open world and really differentiating itself from from uncharted and doing something fresh and unique with it so yeah we'll see it's just uh we're just wondering but um yeah i have to imagine two is going to come back very soon yeah so okay, we got our next one here. So just an update on Final Fantasy VII Remake DLC or some more, more uh, info on what they have planned with it. So no Final Fantasy VII Remake DLC planned. Studio focus is on sequel. So this is IGN. Matt Perslow has the article here. Final Fantasy VII Remake creator, creative director Tetsuyu Nomura has said that Square Enix has no plans for FF7 DLC and that the studio's focus is on completing the next game in the series. Nomura... Nomura clarifies that the upcoming additional content for the PS5 version of the FF, FF7 remake, which features returning original character Yuffie, is technically not considered DLC by the team. Due to the nature of the upgrade system, it resulted in us having to label the new Yuffie sections as DLC. Normira said, however, the original intent was to create a PS5 version of the FF7 uh, remake and not to produce DLC. So at least hidden in that news article, it seems like they're focused on working on that sequel and that next entry of the FF7 remake. But um, how do you feel about this, Cal? Yeah, so so then they're basically just saying that they they don't class the Yuffie stuff as DLC, right? Um, right. I don't really understand what that means, but um, uh, due to the nature of the upgrade system, result in us having to label it. Yeah, I don't know what that means, but um yeah i don't really don't know what sort of he means by that because i mean it obviously is dlc i don't know what, what do you what do you sort of take from it? well at least at the they're they're confirming that it seems like that there's no plans for like another ufi kind of style of entry here like the next focus is on getting that sequel finish so kind of uh, leaving this yeah. behind and working on that solid sequel to uh ff7 mm-hmm. remake so that part two hopefully is coming you know somewhat sooner because now they're yeah all hands on deck working on that yeah well yeah that that's um i mean that that that's definitely sort of something that um is is important for for fans of of the remake because especially with the ps5 upgraded upgrade coming out because i think you're going to see a lot of people replaying through it again and you know refreshing their memory with how things uh sort of happen and and then the iffy thing hopefully will lead into the the sequel um so i'm hoping that we'll see it sooner rather than later um because i mean that that game is just fantastic and um i can't wait to see sort of more of it um and i really really can't wait for the playstation 5 upgrade and the the sort of extra I was going to say DLC, but obviously it's not. <laughs> it's not DLC. It's not DLC. <laughs> the extra content that isn't downloadable. Right. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's honestly, and I, I know lots and lots of people now will be playing it for the first time too, thanks to the fact it's free on PlayStation Plus. Um, so just any news on the next game, I'm all for that. Um, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll announce that soon. Yep. Well, we will see. Callum. So we move on to our next one here. Um, Play at home. So we got PlayStation offering 10 more games, including Horizon Zero Dawn for free. This is Wesley LeBlanc of IGN. Sony will add 10 additional games to its Play at Home program, including Horizon Zero Dawn in the coming weeks. The first nine games will be be available for free to own and download starting next week on March 25th. Those games are Abzu, The Witness, Enter the Gungeon, Subnautica, Res Infinite, Moss, Astrobot Rescue Mission, Paper Beast, and Thumper. 
Then starting April 19th, Horizon Zero Dawn Complete Edition will be available to download for free. First nine games will be available for free to download until April 22nd, and Horizon Zero Dawn will be available until May 14th. Earlier this month, Sony made 2016's Ratchet and Clank available to download for free as part of the stay at home. And last year, it did the same with Uncharted, the Nathan Drake collection, and Journey. Uh, this is dope news for PlayStation uh, fans out there, users. It just seems like this is separate from needing like a PS Plus or, you know, now kind of subscription. This is just a free, full blown mm-hmm. series of PlayStation games for all users. Yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, particularly Horizon Zero Dawn. With, which comes with the DLC. Um, I didn't, I never picked up that DLC, so I'll actually be grabbing mm. that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn is an absolutely brilliant game. So to get that for free is, is, is really quite, um, you know, brilliant, especially with the sequel coming soon. You can imagine that's why they did it. Um, and the other games as well, you know, Subnautica is great. Um, I've heard brilliant things about Enter the Gungeon and The Witness, and Abzu is meant to be good as well. Um, and obviously some love for VR, which is always nice for, for those still, still rocking that horrible headset. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, just the fact that they're free for no reason other than this play at home scheme. Um, it's, uh, yeah, really, really cool. And, and I, yeah, I, I was thinking today about when they did the same with Uncharted and Journey. So it's nice to see them, uh, do it again and to do it in what seems to be a far more, a uh, generous, uh, way. Right. Yeah. This, uh, you don't need some kind of other subscription. It's just a free series of games. So that's dope. And it's a great way to compete with game pass and whatnot. So just a positive deal all around. So can we move on to our next one here? We got Jade Raymond's Haven entertainment studios to develop a new IP for PlayStation. So this is Adam Bankhurst of IGN. Jade Raymond has started Haven entertainment studios an in, an, an independent company in Montreal that will be working on an unannounced new IP for PlayStation. Announced on PlayStation Blog, Raymond wants a studio to create worlds where players can escape, have fun, express themselves, and find community. Raymond recently left Google, where she was leading the now shut down Stadia Games and Entertainment First Party Studio. Prior to Google, Raymond helped create such titles as Assassin's Creed and Assassin's Creed 2, and founded and led both EA's Motive Studio and Ubisoft Toronto. As Raymond took stock of her career over the past few years, she knew she needed to get back to what I love doing most and do so in a way that gives our team the freedom to explore, inspire, and create. So this dropped uh, last week, this news. It's pretty dope and pretty huge to get her back and working on some kind of new IP for PlayStation. So how do you feel about this, Callum? Yeah, I mean, it's um, from just from what she said about you know, expressing yourself and finding community, it sounds like maybe something multiplayer-focused, perhaps, mm. um, which is interesting because the Resistance games had multiplayer, so... Um, you know, you never know. <laughs> Anything to get you? Any <laughs> hoops and hurdles you have to go through? But uh, no, it's, it's yeah, it's great. I mean, she's a she's a big name, and she's worked on some great games. Um, it's always exciting to know that there's something new, you know, a new IP, not a sequel to something being made. Um, uh, so yeah, it's uh, very exciting. Uh, hopefully, we'll see more of it soon. But I mean, it sounds like it's very, you know the early days so we might not hear anything for for a while but it's good to know at least that there's something in the in the pipeline yeah i wonder if sony is focusing on having some of their and this is uh maybe a a a leap of an idea but it seems like they're having a lot of their first parties try and focus on newer ip so we i we know that there's something in the works with uh, god of war dev sony santa monica working on a new ip so maybe they're trying to spend this generation building that series of, you know, core PlayStation games that keeps people there. So rather than rely on the standard, yeah, Uncharted, uh, Last of Us, God of War, expanding a little bit and stri- uh, trying to start these new IPs that are successful, we saw Ghost of, uh, of Tsushima nail it. So yeah, I'd like to see them really start to use this core talent, which is proven that they can, you know, capitalize on existing IP, but create something awesome. So if you can have that same talent work on these new uh, IP and just grow that, that would be a no-brainer. So I wonder if they're going to start to do that this generation. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it'd definitely be a, a, a positive um, way to do things to, you know, not not just focus on new games, which is always the best thing, I think, but to bolster their already, you know, great library of games because we are going to get a new God of War. We're going to get Last of Us multiplayer. Um, we're hopefully going to get a new Uncharted from from, you know, if the rumors are to be believed, um, 
and you know we'll hopefully get a sequel to Days Gone and Ghost of Tsushima. In fact, Ghost of Tsushima is confirmed. Um, so it's not like these games are stopping. Uh, you know, we're not. We've seen the last of these games. It's just that they are bolstering these games with just even more. Uh, you know, we've just seen that new Square Enix game. Uh, like you said, San, Santa Monica are working on something, and now this. It's um, yeah, like you said, it's really exciting and and positive to 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 see this. Yep, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, early works uh, with them, with uh, Jade Raymond Studio. So we'll see how long it takes to get something out of the door. But it's exciting to see what they're what they're working on. So we got our last one here, Callum, is The Last of Us HBO Show. Season one adapts the first game, but will deviate greatly in some episodes. So this is from IGN Jonathan Dornbush. The Last of Us on HBO will directly lift dialogue from the original game, says executive producer Neil Druckmann, but we'll see some episodes deviate greatly from the events we've played previously. One of the biggest questions remains, how closely will the HBO series adhere to the original story? Speaking to IGN during South by Southwest 2021, the Last of Us game director and show executive producer Neil Druckmann spoke about his his and showrunner Craig Mar- Ma- Mazins, Mazins? I was going to say Marzins, Craig Mazins approach to adapting the acclaimed original game. We talked at length that season one of the show is going to be the first game, Druckmann explained, noting that for him and Mazin, the philosophical underpinnings of the story were the essential thing to get right about the adaption. Uh, as far as the superficial things, like should a character wear some the same plaid shirt or the same red shirt, they might or might not appear in it. That's a way less important to us than getting the core of who these people are and the core of their journey. And while Druckmann could not, of course, reveal too much about the team's exact plans for how the series will play out in comparison to the game, he did explain the viewers will certainly recognize some dialogue and be surprised by large parts of the episodes. So, Callum, how do you feel about that core or the the first the first series, the first season, rather, of the show focusing on the first game in the series? Yeah, I think it's um, I think I think that's what we kind of imagined it would it would be. Um, and yeah, I think he's basically just you know just letting people know that it's not going to be exactly the same but it's going to be based on that journey and that that story because as much as the the dialogue scenes are they're much more easily transferable onto tv or film whereas the moment-to-moment gameplay where you're navigating through these levels is not something that can be translated as well so obviously we're going to see different we're probably going to see different you know minor story arcs to to allow more sort of dramatic um, transitions from you know big parts of the big scenes um, to, to sort of replace that those gameplay moments so i think that's probably what he means from some episodes will deviate greatly you know we'll have episodes that will help fill certain gaps and that 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 it can't feel the same way the games did so um yeah i mean i must say i'm the more i hear about this the more excited i get about it i think it definitely sounds like it's in good hands especially with neil Druckmann being uh, on board with it um it's always good to you know have the person whose story it is um sort of on board because they can make sure that it's translating properly and that it's you know giving off the right message and and everything so um, yeah, I'm really, really excited. I'm excited for people who are either unable to play the first game because they they just don't play games, or maybe it's not their kind of game, or uh, they didn't enjoy the kind of game it was. Um, it's nice that they're going to be able to experience this story and these characters without having to play through that game. So um, really, really exciting. And I think we've talked before, but the, I think the casting is great. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see who's going to be cast for through these uh, other roles as well sure yeah we still have um uh who's the woman in the very beginning it's not amy it's uh er, yeah amy the little girl well no the, she's with joel like they have their relationship oh, and then tess. tess there we go tess, yeah we still yeah. haven't had that cast uh, that person cast yet so yeah there's still yeah. a bunch of characters um now when they talk about deviating um from the story a bit I'm thinking that they're going to really switch it up and maybe some characters die that didn't die and vice versa. I think they're going to try and create this, make this be its own, like its own version of the last of us separate from the, Mm -hmm. from the games rather. And I wonder, especially with Neil Druckmann on board, like you mentioned, and them switching it up so much with the last of us too. I feel like this is another route for him to completely 
change ex- expectations or, you know, keep the story, the core of it there rather. But I think we'll see some people hang on for longer than they did or die, you know, much faster. Uh, I'm really excited to see how they switch it up and maybe, maybe we see Joel, you know, uh, it'd be crazy, but maybe he dies in this season rather than like, uh, you know, something else in the, in the future, or I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but it's too late now. Um, but, uh, or, changing uh, Ellie's character arc, maybe that happens faster or longer. Like I'm really excited to see, and I'm hoping that they're really going to double down and just, you know, just really change and, and create something new with this, with this show. Yeah, I think we're, we're definitely going to obviously see some, some changes. It's, it, it's similar to, I suppose, um, like ready player one, for example, the book and the, the movie and, and that had the writer of the book work on the movie too. And, um that the the two deviate completely but it's because it's you know it's difficult to show certain things from a one sort of form of creative media to the other so i think where things like um the hotel i mean that was a massive that was clearly designed for mostly gameplay purposes where you know you get to go into the basement and do the generator and it's a you know it's all you always have to think about the game first when you're sort of designing these locations and these places you go to and uh, the way you meet people and the way things play out. So I think it's definitely going to allow for, you know, new characters, things to happen differently. Um, but I assume that the big parts, like the big, uh, you know, um, where they meet, they go to, is it Bill's Town and uh, they, they run into Robbie and uh, everything like that. I imagine those those big parts will happen but i think the bits that we're used to in terms of us playing it uh will probably be very different and that's we're we're likely to see you know new characters i imagine to help get the story progressing and uh, yeah like you said there might be deaths might happen earlier or differently um to, to to how we saw them um but you know i'd like to think that they're they're gonna at least keep the main plot points um or on the sort of same track but um you know we see it all the time when books are adapted or now games are adapted um it is a way especially when the original creator's on board that he might he might have but he might think to himself you know i wish this had been done differently or if i could go back and do this mate i'd do it this way so this is a chance for him to explore that as well um similar to how we saw for the final fantasy 7 remake you know that, that that's retelling the game and they've really changed a lot uh, there in terms of characters surviving when they died in the original or, or things like that. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, and I'm yeah really, really looking forward to, to seeing it. Yeah. I mean, you're right where one of the things that calls out to me with, uh, changing or, you know, moving away from the original story is say like the walking dead. Now I haven't watched any of the newer walking dead seasons of the shows. It kind of fell off for me, but when they originally, uh, started that show, it was, they made some like really big changes to that comic and then proceeded and kind of created their own universe. So I, I'm thinking it's going to be something like that. And for, for me personally, I want them to do that. I want them to change it, switch it up. I want Joel to die in the first episode. He gets infected. I want it to be, you know, so different from that original game, but maybe that's just me, but I want them to like lean into that and create this different path. Cause we all have the last of us and the last of us too, and we can play those and we've experienced those stories. So let's, maybe, you know, keep the, keep the, the heart of the last of us in the show, but also change it up. Like I'm really down for something different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, with me, I love to see just the exact same. I hate like surprises. (laughs) Sure. Um, I think a lot of fans are going to be angry if they change it up. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind like when it happens, I don't dislike the thing for it. Um, but I would much rather see, like when I read a book and then watch like a TV show, um, I, I much prefer it when they're like exactly the same <laughs> and I, I don't know why I just do. Um, so I, in an ideal world, I'd love to see it mimic it as much as it can. Um, but yeah, I mean, either way I'm happy if they, if they completely change it up, as long as it's just good in general, then I'll be happy with that. Um, but I think with Neil Druckmann working on it, I think we've got every every reason to be optimistic. Yeah, I think he's going to kill it. He's going to make sure it stays true to the, the the heart of what makes The Last of Us, you know, as special. I know there was uh, information that came out after the original game came out that Tess they had ideas of Tess following you 
on your journey. Like she was going to be the main antagonist kind of chasing you guys, Mm -hmm. uh, chasing the characters as they tried to cross the country. So maybe there's something like that. I feel like they're going to keep Tess alive for longer. Um, But yeah, either way, I just want them to get nuts with it. I think they're going to make a lot of fans angry because it's not one for one, a reshoot of the, of the game. But I say, you know, screw it. Just, they're not going to be happy anyways. And they didn't like the last of us too. It's like, who are you really don't appeal to them anyways, (laughs) because they're never happy. So yeah, no, but I'm excited. So, Callum, we can end uh, the show there for the week. And we'll see what happens next week. But where can they find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Bear Munbro. Nice. Get your hot tweets, hot takes on Twitter. You can also follow us, follow us as well on Twitter at Plastic Art Pod. That is it for us this week. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. See you later.